Now, my colleague and friend Parwane Kushariati has written a very exciting book called The Decline and the Fall of the Sicilian Empire. I think it's a book about 500 pages long, uh, trying to suggest that indeed the reason that the Sasanian Empire fell was because uh, the House of uh, Parthians or the Arsacids, the Farrokhzad and Rostam Farrokhzad, the general, uh, the famous general who fought at the Battle of Padesi against the Arabs, uh, were from the family of Arsacids. And at the very moment that the Sasanians needed help uh, to fight the Arabs, they actually pulled, you might say, the rug under them and resulted in the collapse of the Sasanians. This is a tantalizing, I think, hypothesis and very interesting uh, in this suggestion. And we know that Azamidok is killed indeed by one of these generals. I think the important point is there is another general here attempting to take over the throne, regardless of the family association. The third stage of this Sasanian um, uh, fall it is the period of Yazir the third, which I call the wandering kingship, where the king really does not have any power, moving from province to province, trying to uh, gain uh, uh, support. Uh, the numismatic sources, the coinage, beautifully demonstrate his movement. His early years coinage, he, has, uh, he rules for 20 years. The early years, uh, we have his coinage from Fars, uh, from Mesopotamia, from Western uh, Iran, China. As he moves east, those coinage, they stop being produced, and then central Iran starts uh, minting coins. And then finally in the east, Kerman, Yaz, and then Khorasan, or Greater Khorasan. That exactly shows where his power is. Whenever he was in this location, he, coins were minted in his... And then it stopped. That suggests also to us that he doesn't really have that much of a support or support base. Now, there are other interesting and tantalizing ideas about Yaz here as well, uh, about his character, his religious preoccupation. Um, an Italian uh, sinologist, Antonio Forte, about 10 or 15 years ago, wrote several interesting articles uh, about uh, Yaz here and his family, who apparently we thought had paid for the building of Zoroastrian temples in China. Forte has suggested that indeed these were Christian temples and not Zoroastrian is kind of interesting. Uh, but not to, again, for me to judge what it is, but we know if you read the Shah Nomad, it's a popular tradition based probably on the Hodai Nomad version, that the people who find Yazgird's body after the miller has killed him are Christians, who give him a proper burial. So there is something about Christianity that seems to be lurking here vis-a-vis -vis the family of Sassan. And I should just also mention that we know that in the late Sassanian period, there is gravitation by the a certain group, certain family members of the Sasanians and the nobility towards Christianity. And Christianity is quite popular. Now, if that had a hand in its support or lack of support, it's a hypothesis that needs to be proven. But all of this is taking place. So the conquest is much more conquest at least what is going on internally until we get to the area. Okay? okay. So, how did the conquest take place? After Yazgir is killed by a miller, as we're told, in 651 in Khorasan, at the order of Mount Rui, uh, we also come across the conquest. How? How did the Muslims conquer the Sasanian Empire? This is one of these questions that many people have tried to answer. And depending on your nationalist view, uh, if you have a nationalist view, if you have your you know, pro-Islamist pro view, your ideological view, if you're at left, or you, you know, uh, you're secular, you end up giving various reasoning and answers. In fact, there is, I think a better study is to see what in the 20th century has been written about this event and sort of the ideological window of the authors than the event itself that took place in the 7th century. I was just mentioning to Professor Stranach, when I was growing up, uh, reading in Persian mainly, since I didn't know any other language, most of the things I read about ancient Iran were uh, through uh, translations of Soviet bloc historians into Persian. Oh, I can't even mention that. This is one who was part of the Iranian Communist Party and the Tudeh Party. Diakhanov, Petrushevsky, the most important book on Iran, Islam in Iran, 
uh, you know, Granotsky, Pajkolevskaya, uh, you know, all of these were translated into Persian. And that's how we saw and, you know, we came to understand not only the Sasanians, but their downfall as this class-based society where the Mobits are forcing the people, you know, under pressure and, you know, the people are sick and tired and they're willing to open the doors to the Arab Muslims. If you've heard of this common story, this is a very much a nice leftist a Soviet block historiography, which was translated into Persian, and we took it, and Mazdak became this hero, right? This great revolutionary. This is how we've gotten this idea. If you look at the sources themselves, there's none of this that you see. There's no word that says, yes, you know, these Iranians were opening the doors to the gates because they were under a class-based society that they were thinking of Baradari and Baradari brother of inequality. No, this is the writing of historians in the 20th century that has made the resonation with our mind. Especially if you were raised in Iran, that would be what would you have gotten at least. So when we come to the conquest, we do have a set of literature called the Futu literature. And the Futu literature of conquest texts, which discuss in somewhat of a general order uh, as to the siege and the conquest, followed by the subjugation of the provinces and the territories, and then the Futu in general. So if you look at Belaveri and Belaveri type literature, that is the typical thing that you get. There's a, a very good book written on this idea of Futu literature, what you may really call, uh, in Persian and in Arabic, you would call Rajas. It's really a boasting type of the literature, where a group of people who don't have a great organization, as here we're talking about the Arab Muslims, are able to come and defeat this uh, empire that has innumerable army, well organized, very you know, nicely dressed and so on, where there are these people in ragtags and they have you know, no real organization, but you know, God willing, you know, they're able to defeat the, these Persians uh, who are opulent and arrogant. This is the Rajas type of literature, of Belade, the Futu literature, that also has made a dent in our psyche, of course, but that's an uh, earlier type of literature as to why the Muslims are able to defeat the Persians or the Sasanians. So here's another historiography that is interesting. And this in itself, this Futu literature is also retrojecting into the past. They're not writing this in the seventh century when the conquest is taking place. This is written a century or two after the conquest. It's written as sort of uh, to try to boast to the Muslim community, to the Ummah, as to what had happened 200 years ago, how they're able to become the dominant group, and the Zoroastrians, and the Christians, and everybody else are these subaltern sort of the minority religions under their power. Okay? So you must also be very careful when you look at Futu literature. You just can't pick up Allah there and say, oh yeah, conquered, conquered, conquered. You know, there are so many numbers of uh, you know, Iranians and the Muslims are only one tenth of them, but you know, you know, God willing, and you know, a miracle happens and we defeat them. Okay, so that is the literary evidence that we have for the conquest, which is questionable. Now, what I tried to do when I was much younger to try to look at the textual and the material evidence, the coinage and whatever we have in terms of material culture next to each other, see some points, and try to perhaps guess. How was this empire organized, at least in one province of it when I worked on it? How did it change as a result of this Muslim conquest? Uh, how are they similar and different in terms of reporting uh, how the conquest took place and its result? Now, rather than talking about a 250-page dissertation, I'll just tell you in about five minutes, okay? <laughs> really what it means to be done. Well, we know that in terms of the conquest narrative, we know the conquest took, or began from Bahrain, uh, uh, forces going too far, where the caliph, uh, Omar, says, uh, has a famous saying in at tawari and others who says, I wish there was between us and the people of Fars a mountain of fire through which they cannot reach us nor we them. It's interesting that, at least according to Tabari and some other authors, the Muslims weren't really interested beyond Mesopotamia and Fars. In fact, uh, the general is takes or attempts to take farce over on behalf of on the behest of the Muslims is chastised by Omar. It seems that Iraq or Mesopotamia, Iraq was their in center of interest. And they wanted that now be it because of its, you know, agricultural resource, its importance in various ways, and the population makeup, which had a large, of course, Iranian and Aramaic speaking and, and Jewish and 
other groups there. That seems to have been the point of interest uh, to them. But it does happen that the conquest takes on because the, the Muslims, uh, while early on, are defeated uh, in several battles. And at the big battles, they are successful. The most important battle is the Battle of Odyssey. That is something that probably every Iranian who has read history knows about and thinks about even today. As I said, uh, invoking William Faulkner's uh, term, the past hasn't passed. Qadisiyah just took place yesterday. Well, it not only took place for the Iranians yesterday, mind you, during the Iran-Iraq war, if you've seen some of the graffitis and writings during the time of Saddam Hussein, uh, he also had, I remember a French um, author had uh, produced these beautiful war propaganda uh, drawings of the Iraqis that, you know, Rostam is being, uh, the famous Hussainian general, Rostam Farah Sodan, is being slashed by Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas uh, and being killed. And under it says, as we destroyed the Persians, you know, 1400 years ago, we are going to defeat them again. Now, the French author didn't know that this Rostam is not the famous sort of Pahlavan <laughs> Rostam in the Shah Nameh. So this is this great Shah Nameh, uh, you know, uh, you know, person. In fact, he was, Saddam Hussein probably was talking about, but, uh, you know, this Rostam. So this also gets played not only in the Iranian world, but also in the Arab world uh, and during the time of the Iranian world. So this has high sort of ideological, I think, uh, value uh, for either side. Uh, the battle that really uh, puts an end to the Sasanian Empire is the Battle of Nehavan in 642. We have the famous Mardon Shah, who has a very interesting career, a general who fights in Khuzestan, who fights at Nehavan, who's taken prisoner, taken all the way to uh, Mecca. Uh, he becomes Muslim. He, we're told that he actually gives some secrets on how to fight the Iranians. Uh, by the way, we should also mention that there were Iranian elite cavalry uh, that did join the Muslims. So from uh, Iraq and uh, Khuzestan onwards, it wasn't only Arabs conquering the Sasanian Empire. There were Iranian elite cavalry who were also joined in uh, to conquer uh, uh, the Sasanian Empire. You might say, how could these Iranians do this? Well, we're living in the post 19th century, 18th century nationalist days, okay? For us, that seems sort of strange. But if you think of group uh, solidarity and their interest, uh, you could switch sides easily if you could keep your status and power and your wealth. That could happen. And Mohsen Zakari has written a fabulous book on the Ayyarun and the Sasanian elite cavalry, which, if anybody's interested, convincingly has shown uh, this. I think without a doubt. Now, this conquest, it, that, I'm not here to say that it was a you know, jolly event. No conquest is jolly. In fact, uh, what happens is uh, Mardan Shah is killed, uh, by the way, once Omar is killed uh, by Omar's son. Uh, uh, Rai, uh, the city of Rai, uh, we're told that accepts to pay uh, jizya, 